getting back to the basics, the very fundamentals of seeking God. You're having coffee with Conrad on... Conrad Rocks! Hey everybody, it's Conrad from conradrocks.net. Rocks of Revelation being poured out to you. My passion is for you to have a spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus. That's what I've been talking about for quite some time. You know, when I started ConradRocks.net, it was a long time ago, and my motivation was different. And I, I originally saw the frustration of people with the state of America. I mean, I did this a long time ago. And I knew that Jesus was the only solution. So, in the beginning, it was Jesus, liberty, and things that rock. And I knew that pushing a button every two to four years was not going to solve the ills of America. America had a heart problem. And my fundamental scripture was Second Chronicles 7.14. It was just something ringing in my spirit. If my people, you know, there's, it's a challenge by the Lord. It was originally to the Jews, to the people Solomon was dedicating the temple. But this is the nature, character, and authority of God. This is his nature. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, notice the if-then correlation, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So I stuck with that that premise for quite some time. Then, you know, going from Jesus, liberty, and things that rock, God gave me this paradigm shift. And it was rocks of revelation being poured out to you. I had no idea. I had no idea what that meant. I just knew I was supposed to put it on the blog. As I progress in my relationship with the Lord, I realize that I have to shore up my fundamentals. I mean, it, it, do you realize how easy it is to forget and get so far away from the fundamentals that you just forget them? And, and in football, when you're learning to play football, you've got to learn your fundamentals. It's the first thing that you learn. You learn how to block correctly. You learn how to tackle correctly. You learn how to run straight. You learn how to get in a three-point stance, a four-point stance. You learn the fundamentals. You know how to make a spiral on the football. All that. Fundamentals. And then you worry about the game. (laughs) Then you worry about the play calling. And this brings me to a dream that I had, I don't know, a decade or two ago, God keeps bringing it to my remembrance. And this is one of the ways the Holy Spirit works. He will bring to the remembrance whatsoever he has told you. And oftentimes that will be scriptural revelation. Oftentimes that'll be just something he gives you in the spirit. And sometimes it's a dream. And this dream, something triggers, you know, you're approximating an environment and something triggers that dream, and the Holy Spirit will bring to remember it something that he showed you. And one of those dreams was a football game. He spoke in my vernacular. You know, God can speak in his own symbols, but sometimes he speaks like the, uh, you know, like to the baker and the butler. Trees and birds, he speaks in, in common everyday language. And he was speaking to me into the, in the form of a football game. When I reflect upon that dream... I realized that when God speaks, there's echoes of revelation. You know, that first, that first obvious revelation is like when a rock hits the water on a pond. You know how when you see this rock, it'll hit the water. And the first thing that happens is that obvious first wave. But there's subtle ripples that expand and go out. And this is like a parable. A parable and a dream are very similar in in the fact that God wants us to meditate on it day and night. Right? When he gives us a dream, 
Um, sometimes it's instructions like, Joseph, go to Egypt. <laughs> you know, I don't think he had to meditate on that one. But when Daniel was meditating on his dream, he thought about it purposely, and he, he even fasted. He says, look, I'm going to keep my mind stayed upon this, this dream or this vision, and I'm going to stick with this. And he stuck with it 21 days, and an angel came to give him wisdom and understanding in that revelation. So when God gives us dreams, you know, it's a good idea to write them down. As soon as they happen, as much detail as possible, and then ask God what it's all about. And God keeps bringing this dream about me being a quarterback, and I was actually a quarterback in high school, and I'm on the sidelines. And the quarterback in the game, he's messing up. He's making mistakes. And I look at the coach, and he nods for me to go in. And as I go in, I realize that we're down. We're down by a few points. We absolutely have to have a score. And there's just a few seconds on the clock. So I realize that everybody knows it's going to be a Hail Mary pass. Amen. Nick Sarah says to cultivate the discipline of writing your dreams down as soon as you receive them. John the Revelator didn't wait till after his discussion with God. He wrote down as he was getting the revelation. Revelation is like a dream. Uh, You're in the spirit. The spirit is kind of like being in a dream world. You're conscious observer. Your conscious, your carnal mind is an observer mainly at that point. Notice how John was mainly an, an observer. And um, if we don't write down our dreams as soon as we have them, they're going to be lost in our spirit. And when we write them down and we review them later, it's like walking back to Ezekiel's River. We know how to get back to that. It's like almost like recapturing the butterfly. But going back to my dream here, I knew everybody knew it was going to be a Hail Mary pass. You know, one of those, oh my gosh, it's got to be, this has got to be where we win. When we write, so I threw the ball, you know, I I found some receivers open. I'm like, you know, I don't know how this is going to work out, but they're fumbling the ball on the end, close to the end zone. And I'm like, catch it and run in. And then the dream is over. So I don't know how that dream is going to turn out, but God often shows me. He bring when I approximate an environment where this dream is appropriate, God, the Spirit of Truth will will bring this to my remembrance. And it's like, you know, what what is going to happen? Are they going to catch the pass? Are they going to run in? Are they motivated? Are they skilled enough? So when I meditate upon this, I realize that, you know, we're in a football game, we're actually playing the game, but today God's talking to me about the fundamentals. And do you realize, I want to just kind of put a few things out on the the plate here for us to chew over. Because it's really interesting. Sometimes I have these major, what to me seem to be a, a major revelation, a major epiphany. And then I realize, oh, I'm a doofus. This is basic Christianity 101. This is simple stuff. This is the beginning. That's some of the stuff I want to kind of go over with you today. I was praying about it this morning. I I had no idea I was going to talk about this until just a few minutes before I went on. I was praying about it, and God's like, hey, let's talk about the fundamentals here. And one of them is Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In the knowledge of the holy is understanding. You know, there's probably lots of scriptures where, you know, Jesus says, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. And, you know, I know we're, we're, we're going to talk about love in a second, but fear, you know, fear of the Lord, that's something, it's a fundamental. <laughs> it's a fundamental. Um, People that do not obey the gospel, people that do not come into the kingdom, that's not good. Their destiny is hell, eternal punishment. So once we realize this, 
then this fundamental should override all of our ambitions. I mean, think about it. This is the most important thing. We don't want to go to hell. And number two, you know, number one, we don't want others to go to hell. And and I want to go to the Lord's Prayer here for a second. The Lord's Prayer is not give me my daily bread. It's give us. We're a team, guys. Just like the football game. We're a team. We need to get everybody across the finish line. We need to get everybody across the finish line. We don't need to be selfish. And if we're only concerned with our salvation, you know, whosoever seeks to save his life shall lose it, then we're, we're playing wrong. We need to seek the salvation of others. That's good, Denise. Denise keeps a dream book next to her bed. Now, I'm a little bit more digital. I have a, a free journal application on the internet which syncs across my phone and my computer and I use hashtags. I have a, a dreams and vision hashtag. Uh, so I can click the hashtags and all my dreams will come up and it's also searchable. That's one of the things I like about it. But you know, go back go back through those dreams. Um now speaking of that, if if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, then let's talk about another beginning, like the greatest commandment. The greatest commandment, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and strength. It's going to be, I mean, it's all over the place. It's originally in Deuteronomy 6, 5. Um, It says uh, in the NIV, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, And with all your strength, I always do the King James. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. All thy mind, all thy strength, all thy heart, all thy soul. And if this is a fundamental precept, you've got the fear of the Lord is the beginning, and then the love. I mean, this is basic Christianity 101. So what I want to ask myself is, is my fruit showing that I love the Lord thy God with all my heart. You know, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You know, when you fall in love with your spouse, you actually think about them in your heart. You're consumed with pursuing them, okay? Um, With all thy mind, do you think about God, right? With all thy strength, do you do things for God? I mean, is, is what you do, is everything you do, you know, is it, geared toward the love of God. Are you consumed with the love? And that I'm preaching to me today because I'm going to show you kind of a paradigm that I had a problem where where I found out truly where I was, right? And this is not something that you you can achieve carnally. We're going to get into that in a second. But I found out a lot about myself when my dad was diagnosed with a brain tumor in June 1st of 1999. I was on a trip in Michigan. The phone rings. This man that I'd never heard of before, I never knew him. He said, uh, I I didn't know who he was. He says, your dad has a glioblastoma multiforma brain tumor. He has four and a half months to live. And at that point, I'm like, who is this dude? You know? Um, and my dad actually died October 15th, four and a half months to the day the stranger called up and said, your dad has four and a half months to live. And I'm like, well, you know what? That's not going to (laughs) happen. I'm going to go down there. I dropped everything. I moved, uh, I moved in with dad and I'm like, we're going to fast. We're going to pray. We're going to pull out all the stops. I did all the Christian stuff, right? Got on our knees. I mean, I did everything and dad still died. But I want to tell you something that happened that I learned about myself. And it, it, this is really interesting um, in the fact that before Dad died, I started having these panic attacks, serious panic attacks. I would wake up scared to death, a Christian, scared to death, 1999. I mean, I, I would run outside into the backyard, and I was sure that my heart was going to explode. And my heart would not stop racing. 
And after I, if you follow my blog posts and my podcast, I tell you how I got over panic attacks, how I got over depression. It was all God, um, but he walked me through it. But what I realized is that I relied upon my dad. This is why I had panic attacks. Now, looking back, you can see. So looking back, I can see that dad was my pastuio. We're going to talk about pastuio for a second. Dad was who I could rely upon. He always, if I ever got in trouble, dad would come to the rescue. It didn't matter. He would walk through fire for me. Panic. Dad would walk through fire for me, and I would walk through fire for him. <laughs> yeah, I know, Denise. I was like, who is this man? That's telling me my dad. Who is this strange voice? I'm gonna I'm gonna pull out all the Christian stuff I know. You know we're gonna beat this. <clears throat> but anyway, so there's this there's this paradigm that we have. You can always go home. A lot of us as kids, when I I went off to Hollywood to be an actor, to be a rock star, I did all that. I went to music school. Um, I did plays. Actually, you know, I, I was studying acting in Hollywood, and. Um, Then I got into business, and then I got into drugs and alcohol. It just kind of, it turned into a big mess. It was all me, 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 me. I wanted to fulfill the um, desire, the lust of my father. I was backslidden. The devil, I will do. You know, I was in the world. I wanted to be above people. I wanted to receive worship. And uh, that's what rock star, you know, people that seek to be rock stars, they want to be loved by people and worshiped. And that's, that's what happens when you're, in that life. I've seen Hollywood chew up and spit out wholesome people. Some people that simply just wanted to be better musicians uh, come to Hollywood and go home with tracks on their arms. You know, it's it's a terrible city to... Uh, it was really bad. I've seen that city just chew up people and spit them out. It happens when you're... So anyway, my dad, as I was having these panic attacks, I realized that my always-could-go-home paradigm was about to disappear. At that point, I was going to have to stand on my own two feet. I was going to have to, you know, take care of things myself. But I didn't realize subconsciously that this is what was going on. And in 1999, I was a Christian. I had my encounter with God in 1995. If you guys follow my podcast, I talk about this a lot. But I had that encounter with God in 1995. And my fundamentals of the fear of the Lord and loving the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and strength wasn't really setting in. Because I was relying upon my dad. If I needed money, you know, if if things, you know what I'm saying? I didn't need money. But if I did, dad would be there. You know what I'm saying? And... So that was gone. There was no more going home. So now, pistuio, I'm going to tell you about the Greek word pistuio. And this is in the famous verse John 3.16. In John 3.16, and this is why I'm going into the Greek on this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever pistuio in him pistuio in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So I'm always struggling with the word believe because believe in 1611 had a lot more weight than it does in 2018. It meant something else. You know how you know how words change over time? You know, like a, a unicorn used to be a bull. Like cool used to mean, you know, not hot. Like sick used to mean, you know, People were actually sick, and today it means cool. You know how the words change. So when the when the King James people were writing down the word believe, it meant this. And I'm reading this from the Vines New Testament. Pistuio is the Greek 4100. It's to believe, also to be persuaded of, and hence to place confidence in, to trust. Signifies in this sense of the word reliance upon, not mere credence. It means reliance upon, not mere credence. So when we use the word believe today, we might say, I believe it might rain tomorrow. And God is saying here, no, 
you need to rely upon God. So, as I was going through this Job type, I mean, it was a big trial for me. It wasn't like Job, but it was my it was my trial, and I lost my dad. I realized that Jesus says things like this, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his ways of doing things right, and all this stuff will be added. All your needs will be met, you know, your, your food, water, and clothing. And I realized it's another first. Fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. To love the Lord thy God with everything is another beginning. And then Jesus says, Seek ye first. This is another fundamental. So as I was seeking God, now I'm not just simply thinking about God, I'm seeking God. Seeking His, do you understand what seeking is? It's not just something you give a hat tip to. This is something that you fast, you pray, you meditate, you get down on the floor and you lay there and you just think about a certain verse over. I mean, I'm telling you, these are the things that I do. Like, for instance, Karen Jackson, she's not with us anymore, but one of the things she said to me, she said, Conrad, the first sentence in the Bible, I couldn't get past the first four words. She said, God just kept giving me page after page after page of revelation on in the beginning God. In the beginning, God. She said she she couldn't go any further. God just kept talking to her. And guess what? That's another first. You know, we can meditate on those four words. Now, let me tell you, seeking God, okay? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt with man, if you go down to John 1.14. But no man can get to the Father but through the Word. If Jesus is the Word... And no man can get to the Father but by Him. Meditating on the Word is how you seek God. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. In it you will meditate day and night, and with it you will have good success. I have hidden your Word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. This Word, when we meditate upon the Word, when we meditate upon the parables of Jesus, when we meditate upon the dreams, you know... um, This is similar, but I can prove it more biblically. When we meditate upon the Word, that is what gives us access to the Father. That's why He speaks to us in parables, so we'll meditate upon it. So, we need to seek God. And not just give him lip service. I mean, seek him. He's a spirit. God is a spirit. Those who worship him must do so in spirit and truth. It's a it's a requirement. You can't throw out the spirit. You can't ignore the spirit. You've got to be, you've got to have a spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus. Now, let me tell you something that happened, a couple of things that happened. I have testimony after testimony after testimony about how God has saved me over and over and over again. But I'm going to give you a couple of testimonies to kind of show you what I'm talking about. One day, you know, I used to have a penthouse. I had 50 employees. I had cars and boats. And I mean, I was doing well. And then I met Jesus in 1995. Everything changed. So I ended up living in a room. You know, I'm like, none of that stuff was important. Not Wealth was not important to me anymore. Okay. So I'm living in this room in, in Houston, Texas. And uh, I don't have much money in my bank account. And I'm swiping my card to buy groceries for food that I need to eat, to live. And guess what? My card is declined. So I have to leave my groceries there. I have to walk away. I can't buy food. And I'm praying. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. When you are in a dire situation like that, it's better to develop your relationship with the Lord beforehand. So when you're in the fire, you have that relationship already established so you can hear from God in the fire. Don't wait until you're in the fire to seek God. Seek Him first. See what I'm saying? So when you have that relationship, He can order your steps. He can guide you. So during that time of me going, oh, well, I wonder, I actually said, I wonder how God is going to save me. Because I've seen God do this over and over and over again, where he'll just, like, get me out of a mess. <laughs> okay. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Well, I'm the one that walked through the valley of the shadow of death. He didn't tell me to go that way. So, 
when I did that, mess, when I messed up, you know, I did something stupid and I was overdrawn on my bank account. And uh, anyway, I'm getting in my car and God says in the spirit to go to your mailbox. So the funny thing is, I mean, this is like God. OK, this is how God works. I mean, it's amazing. I had just enough gas to go to my mailbox, which was about 20 something miles away. Stupid. And I was so I had to have because I didn't have enough gas to like get back. That's my point. <laughs> OK, so I had enough gas to go to my mailbox and in my mailbox was some money. Way more than enough to cover my groceries. Way more than enough to cover my gas. And it's next to my bank. So I'm like going, praise the Lord. So I'm just going to tell you, when you seek the Lord first, when you fear the Lord, then you love Him and you seek Him. And I'm not, I'm not all that in a bag of chips on this. I'm just letting you know, this is, this is a one beggar showing another beggar how to find bread. This is something I've learned, okay? So I've learned to seek God in the green seasons. That way when things are dry... You already know how to get to him. You know how to get back to that Ezekiel River. You know that you have kept track of your dreams. So you know how to get back to the spirit that gave you those dreams, right? You wrote them down. So now you know how to get back to that dream, right? Isn't it funny? Because when God gives you a spiritual dream, you write it with physical words. And then when you access those physical words, it takes you back to that dream. You see what I'm saying? You can get back to that dream. And that dream came from God. Amen? So, another time, I'm going to just tell you guys another time, and this is why we seek God in the green season, so when we're in the fire like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we can say, hey, I don't care what you do, O king, God's going, God has got me, and I don't even care if I die. They don't care if they die because they love the Lord that God with all their heart, mind, and strength. They know it's all about God. It's not about me. It's not about my plan. It's about God and His plan for salvation for everyone, not my own personal salvation. So their obedience, because they sought the Lord in the green season, in their dry season, changed a nation. They saved a nation. Do you understand their unselfishness got the whole nation to be saved? Watch what Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar writes a chapter in the Bible. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So um, it changed the nation. He says, whosoever does not worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, let their houses be torn down. I mean, if you remember that, uh, I think he might have done that more than once, actually. I don't want to get him confused. But here's another time where God met my needs. And this is after I was married. One of the cool things about being married is... When you operate in the prophetic, when you walk with God, so many things happen in your life where God just does amazing things. And you can't tell anybody because they're not going to believe you. Like my phone, my phone is a prophetic phone. Every once in a while, it will just start playing scripture. Or it will, I mean, the scripture that's not even like, like one time, if you guys follow me on Periscope or whatever, I'll talk about it every once in a while. And it'll it'll be what is on the mind of the Lord at that time, okay? And Susan's been with me a few times when that's happened. I'll be sitting there in the kitchen, and then all of a sudden the phone will dial somebody. Uh, and, it, and we were supposed to talk to them, and they were going through something. Susan has been there with me one time where the computer that was off, it will turn on, it turned on, and then it talked about, uh, it played a video about Ephesians 4.11. And that was the day that I had that open vision about Ephesians 4.11 and all that. God was talking about Ephesians 4.11. So I was so glad that she gets to see a couple of these things that happen. I'm like, man, nobody's going to believe me. So I don't even talk about them. But she's been there for a few of them. And after we were married, we were we were coming up against the wall on rent. And, you know... I've seen God move in my life way a lot of times, and I'm like going, you know, he's going to do it again, but I don't know how. So what I did is I got down on my knees, and I'm like, Lord, you know, I know you always come through, but I'm married now. Can you, can you like not make this so tense? <laughs> you know, I'm like going, because it's a little different when you're married. And so anyway... I'm down on my knees. I'm seeking God. We're not going to make rent. You know, that's that's what it looks like in the natural. And I get up and I walk back to my desk, kind of like I am now. And my phone rings. And somebody, I answer the phone. I didn't recognize the number. And somebody says, 
God just told me to give you a thousand dollars. This happened. No joke. I said, I'll be right over. So it's what I'm saying. If we have these fundamentals down, if we seek ye first, if we learn the fear of the Lord, not just for me, but for everybody, the fear, you know, we need to snatch those people that are being, save them from the fire. There are people going to hell. We, if we're just concerned with our own personal salvation, then we're going to look at the fear of the Lord. We're going to kind of maybe, kind of maybe miss the mark a little bit. Because if we're seeking to save our own life and nobody else's, then we're not, we're not on the team. We need to be on the football team that God has set up, right? In football teams, you got to learn the fundamentals first. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The next one is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, strength. You know there's more than one verse on that. And does our fruit reflect it? And I talked about, uh, I talked a little bit about how my fruit, I was actually re- relying upon my dad in the natural, and I wasn't relying upon the Lord. God taught me to rely upon him. And I pray that I get stronger in that. Pistuio, I talked about the Greek word pistuio, which is the underlining word, underlying word for John 3.16 for believe. It means to rely upon. It doesn't mean merely give credence. Right? Then I talked about how Jesus says, Seek ye first the kingdom. That's first. And we got to seek God in spirit. God is a spirit. Those who worship him must do so in spirit and truth. This is a requirement. It's not, you know, keep in mind the Apostle Paul. He was carnally serving the Lord, fulfilling the prophecy of Jesus Christ, saying, hey, disciples, there's going to be people that are killing you, thinking they're doing God a service. Saul was one of those people. He was zealous for God, but he was living in the futility of his carnal mind and was killing the children of God because of it. He says, you know, God forgave me because I did it in ignorance. So then after that, I talked about, I gave you a couple of examples about how God paid my rent one day and I was overdrawn buying groceries. So that's kind of a recap. But anyway, sometimes I have these major revelations, major epiphanies, and I'm just like blown away. And then I realize this is the beginning. We got to get back to the fundamentals, guys. Anyway, everybody, thank you for being in my life. If this has touched you, please share this and uh, with your friends and family. Till we meet again, dig deeper and go higher. Dig deeper, go higher at comraderocks.net.